So the next component of intervention are the function-based interventions. Again, now this isn't as uh, prescriptive as, as the HRT piece was. This can't be as prescriptive because it's more individualized. Uh, what we're trying to do in, in function-based intervention is to identify environmental events that exacerbate or maintain tics for a given child. Um, we then, once we figure out what events are associated with increases in tics, then we modify those tic, uh, might modify those environmental events to, in order to bring about reduction in tics. Uh, the child's reactions to the tics are often, are, to the events are often modified in service of tic reduction as well, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So we have three steps here, functional assessment, developing interventions, and then developing a plan for implementation of those interventions and any training that might go with it. So functional assessment. What we do in the functional assessment is to interview the patient and the parent asking about any antecedents and consequences that are associated with uh, notable exacerbations of different tics. Again, we're not asking, tell us what happens right before and after tics occur. What we're asking is tell us what's happening around the time you see explosions of ticks or higher than normal ticks. All right. Uh, we also will ask in the interview about reactions to the situations, cognitions that they might be having that might be impacting the situations, etc. <clears throat> so we use something like this, and this is actually in the therapist guide that we have that describes this manual and the workbook that goes with it. We have this form that. Uh, uh, you can use to help facilitate your interview. And what we, what we do here is this. We have across the top, let's see, across the top we have antecedents and consequences. Now these antecedents are different antecedents that are, are commonly found to influence tick frequency. All right? But keep in mind these are just like markers. If somebody endorses this, like for example, classroom as an antecedent that triggers your, their tics, that's just a note to you as a clinician to go in and ask more detail about that situation. Okay? It's not meant to be a broad, all classrooms make tics worse. Same with consequences. You need to understand the whole context of the situation. This is just helpful to guide your interview. So we'll do something like this. Let's say we're working on head jerking first, the first tick up there. We'll do a functional assessment interview on head jerking. So I'll sit down with the patient and the parent, and I'll say, I want you to think about your head jerking tick. I want you to think about times in the day when your head jerking tick is worse, worse than it normally is. And I'm going to read you a series of, of situations, and I just want you to tell me whether your tick, hap that head jerking tick, happens more than usual in that situation, all right, more than normal. How about in the classroom? Does your head jerking tick happen more than normal in the classroom? And the kid says, yeah, you know, it does. It happens more, more in class than, than other times. So I put a one down there. How about at home after school? Does your, your head jerking tick happen more at home right after school? No, it's pretty normal there. How about uh, in public places other than school? Does your ticks, do your ticks flare up in public places or any public places other than school? Not really. How about watching television or playing video games? Does it, does it get worse in, in any of those situations? He says, yeah, it gets a lot worse. And I say, which one? He says, playing video games. No, watching TV. Yeah, watching TV. It gets worse when I watch TV. Okay. So how about playing sports? Nope, doesn't really happen much at all when I play sports. How about during meals? Nope. How about um, anticipating that something might happen? No, blah, blah, blah. So we, how about doing homework? Yeah, it gets worse there. So I put a three there because that's the third situation. And then it doesn't really get worse in any of those other situations. So then I go back and I say, well, let's talk about the classroom. You said your head jerking tick happens more in, in the classroom. Does it happen any more in certain classes than others? And the mom thinks, yeah, you know, I've heard his, his, his uh, reading teacher and his social studies teacher say that it happens a lot in, in her class. Okay. Are there any classes, John, where it doesn't happen? It doesn't happen in science class very much, and it doesn't happen in phys ed very much. And there actually are studies that show that subject matter makes a difference in how frequently ticks occur. I mean, it's differentiated down to subject matter level. And uh, John, John says, it doesn't happen in science, and it doesn't happen in phys ed. Now, if you're doing a good functional assessment interview, you shouldn't stop there either. You should say, okay, so tell me about, 
reading and social studies. What do you do in those classes? What goes on in those classes? Well, not much. It's pretty boring. We just have to sit there and we have to read out of books. Basically, we read a paragraph and the teacher asks a question and we answer it. And then we read another paragraph and the teacher asks a question and we answer it. It's really boring. Okay. What about science? What do you do in science? Well, we work at labs. We have to stand up at our lab tables and we work in little groups and we do experiments and stuff like that. Okay. What about in phys ed? No, I mean, we do play games and stuff like that. Okay. Interesting. So we're listening. Now, if you're listening to this, what are you hearing? I mean, functionally, what might you be hearing? Any guesses? What's that? He's relaxed. He's physically occupied. He's doing things. He's enthused. There's something interesting going on. In, in reading and social studies, what's happening? He's not he's bored. He's physically restrained. He's, he's, he's down. There's not much room for activity. So those kinds of things can be influencing it. And again, the whole time you're interviewing, you're, you're getting these hypotheses. You're thinking, thinking through what might be happening. Then we say, okay, you said watching TV, playing video games. You said it gets worse when you play, when you watch TV, but it's not so bad during video games. Mom, do you think that's true? Yeah, I'd say that's actually true. John, are there any uh, shows that you watch that, that, you know, make it worse, make it better? And John says, well, when I watch sports, it doesn't happen very much. Like I watch football and it doesn't happen very much. Mom, is that true? Yeah, you know, it kind of is. I actually don't notice it very much when he's watching sports with his, with his dad. What shows make it worse, John? Mom makes me watch Desperate Housewives on Sunday. It gets worse. <laughs> is that true? You make him watch Desperate Housewives? And then mom says, yeah, I do. Um, so, so that... So what we find, and John, do you like Desperate Housewives? No, I think it's boring. I just want to watch something else. Okay, so now we start to see our hypothesis confirmed a little bit. Okay, it's not video games because he's active, he's occupied, physically kind of doing things. He he he's mentally engaged. When he's when he's when he's down, when he's bored, when he's watching TV, idle, it starts to increase a little bit. Now, what about doing homework, John? How do you do homework? My mom puts me in my room, and she makes me just do homework. I have to sit there, and I never get to get up until my homework's done. How do you like doing homework? I hate it. It's boring. And you start to see the same kind of pattern go up. Okay? So now you start to see what we're talking about with antecedents isn't necessarily any one of these situations. It's what's going on within the situation. It's restricted physical activity, and it's, it's un, uh, uninteresting cognitive activity. Those are the two things that seem to be triggering ticks for him. And then it starts to give you intervention possibilities, yeah. How much of uh, the increase in sex during downtime and boredom, you know, is due to the kid, kid maybe being more aware and paying more attention as opposed to being distracted and doing something that they enjoy? So are they just hypervigilant and paying attention more? Uh, so could be. It could be that. It could be just boredom is usually associated with physical inactivity too. So it could be just less competing motor activity at that point. I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, and, and, so it's, it's kind of hard to say, honestly. Um, we also then look at consequences. We say, okay, John, you said you ticked a lot more in the classroom than usual. I'm going to ask you about some reactions to ticks people might have in the classroom. And just tell me whether or not any of these happen for you, particularly in reading, particularly in social studies. Does anyone in those classes, like your teacher ever, or your peers, ever tell you to stop ticking? John says, yes, my, the guys who sit in the class next to me because they get distracted when I keep doing this next to them. They tell me to stop it all the time. They're always saying something because they're trying to read and it bothers them. Okay, so I put a one up there. The one corresponds to the one that was back here, so it links the antecedent to the consequence. Uh, what about does anybody ever comfort you? Comfort me? No, what are you talking about? Nobody comforts me about this in class. What about uh, anybody laughing at you? They, they laugh at you? No, not in class. They just get irritated and tell me to stop. Okay, what about um, asking you to leave? Does your teacher ever ask you to leave? No. Does your teacher ever let you out of work? Does she ever tell you you don't have to read anymore? No, not really. And we go through all those. And really the only consequence that he's meeting is somebody telling him to stop his ticks. Then we say, well, what about watching television? When you're watching Desperate Housewives with your mom, does your mom ever tell you to stop? Oh, yeah, all the time because she can't focus on her show. So she tells me to stop. Um, I wish she'd just make me leave, like leave the room, so I wouldn't have to watch it. 
but she keeps making me stay. So mom tells her to stop, we put the two there, link back to there. And no other consequences while watching TV. What about doing homework, John? Does anybody tell you to stop doing your ticks when you're doing your homework? No, I pretty much do it by myself, so nobody tells me to stop. So I don't get that. Does anybody comfort you? No, because I'm, again, I'm kind of by myself. Um, does anybody laugh at you? No, not really. The only thing that happens is, you know, when I do a lot of the ticks, I'll start getting upset and going <coughs> like that, and my mom will hear me. She'll just tell me to take a break. She tells me I can stop doing it for a while, and then I can go outside and play until I'm ready to come back and do it again. Okay, well, that's good. So then we have that. We link that three back to the three over here. When we get done, what we have is a very interesting link between uh, ticks and outcomes, uh, environmental effects. Now, interestingly, we, we actually have a former graduate student of mine who's now a faculty member at Utah has gotten a hold of this data set, and he's starting to look at the links between environmental reactions and urges to tick, and he's finding some very interesting uh, findings. The more times kids encounter escape contingencies, the more times they're let out of situations because of ticks, the higher their urge ratings are. Uh, and we're finding a, a whole host of other kinds of uh, relationships between um, environmental events and urge severity and tick severity too. So it, it really does look like some of these reactions can maybe link some of these things together uh, behaviorally, which is, is kind of wild. Uh, so in any case, we, after we complete a functional assessment, then we're developing function-based interventions. And, and Really, I mean, function-based interventions, I can't tell you do X, Y, or Z because everybody's a little bit different. But what we essentially are doing here is working with the patient to develop different strategies to reduce the ticks given the results of the assessment, keeping the following points in mind. If there is a tick exacerbating situation that the child doesn't need to be in, then remove it. There's no reason to force that poor child to watch Desperate Housewives turn it off. Let them go watch something else. You know, don't expose them to that. You know, we hear parents say, well, my, my child ticks a lot worse when he gets tired. You know, he's, at 10 o'clock at night, his ticks just flare up. And my question is, why is your kid up at 10 o'clock at night? Get him to bed at 8. You know, and if he fights, then work on that. But th there's, a, there's a fatigue issue there. His, his ticks will get worse when he's tired. Get him to bed earlier. Get him more sleep. And, and, and so, you know, there are those kinds of things. Um, that, that, you know, if we can eliminate the situation, that's the first thing we start on. We also then think about removing potentially reinforcing consequences to the tick and tick exacerbating situations. So we go in and talk to the teachers. We say, you know what? Uh, we need to talk to his class. We can't have the other kids reacting to this anymore. That's got to stop. So we do some peer education, for example. We tell mom, you know, when he, if you're going to make him watch Desperate Housewives, you don't get to, you don't get to tell him to stop. You know, we prefer he leave, but if not, you can't react to it anymore. Uh, instead of letting him out of his homework, we're going to give you a different strategy. You know, we're going to have fixed breaks regardless of how frequently he's ticking where he can do something else for a very brief period of time, but you're not going to allow him to get out because of his ticks anymore. We've got to change some of this. And once we explain it to the parents, they're like, oh, yeah, I get it. This, this makes sense. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that now that we've done this functional assessment, we have a really good description of situations that will make their ticks worse. And so now these should serve as reminders. Hey, you should know that when you go into this situation, your ticks are worse. Really pay attention to using your habit reversal exercises here. This is a really good reminder. This is the time to do it. Um, we also want to think about what happens in situations that aren't very easily modifiable. You know, we can't just say, don't go there for example. Don't, don't go to school if they make, it makes your ticks worse. That doesn't work. So what can we do? Well, in that case, we have to teach patients strategies to minimize the impact of situations. So for example, we know, well, we thought we do. Here's something interesting. Stress is associated with tick increases in a lot of people. The belief is that stress makes ticks worse. We just did a study. It's actually coming out in, in behavior research and therapy I don't know when, but it'll be soon, that looked at the effects of stress on ticks. And we induced stress in kids with Tourette's through some mild stress induction, doing timed math tests. And what we found was that actually stress doesn't make ticks worse than baseline levels. Stress by itself does not increase ticks. However, it does do something. 
what it does is makes the suppressibility of ticks more difficult. So when you're stressed and asked to suppress, you can't suppress very well, as opposed to if you're suppressing alone. So why is it that people say, for example, stress makes their ticks worse? Well, it's probably not that stress itself makes ticks worse. It's probably that, think about this. If you're in a situation that's stressful, what does that usually mean? That usually means you're being evaluated. You're, you're, there's some expectation of performance. Some, the eyes are on you. you know, you're, you're the center of attention. Okay? If you're a person with Tourette's and you're the center of attention, what do you want to do? Not tick. All right? So you try to not tick. But if you're stressed because you're the center of attention and you're to not tick, and ticks, have, uh, suppressibility of ticks isn't as good when you're stressed, it's going to feel like you're ticking a lot more than you should be or the, than you want to be, which makes it feel like stress makes ticks worse. When you, when you look at raw frequency, stress doesn't make ticks worse from what, our, what we've been able to show, but what it does is make it more difficult to control ticks, and therefore it probably feels like it's more happening more frequently. Okay. So that's a side note, but uh, when we have, if high stress situations are, no, are experienced as exacerbating ticks, we'll teach relaxation strategies to deal with that. You can't get kids out of high stress situations all the time, nor should you want to necessarily, because your child has to learn how to function in stressful situations as well. If, for example, let's say you know, a child has some social phobia going on, you might want to work towards doing some cognitive restructuring to bring about the anxiety that's, that's creating the social phobia if that so social situations uh, increase tick frequency. So you might end up having to do cognitive restructuring, for example, uh, to deal with something like that. Taking scheduled activities or breaks. You know, you don't want your child, your child can't not go to reading class. Your child can't not go to social studies class. Um, so what do we do in those situations? Well, what we do is we say, okay, we can modify your child's environment. We maybe we'll put them in the back of the classroom rather than, rather than right up front. Maybe every 10 minutes they're allowed to get up and stretch and walk around and sit back down. You know, maybe those kinds of things are, are strategies your, your child can use. And so we try to modify the situations that way as well. And generally, one of the things we try to do is minimize the impact of the ticks on the child. So... You know, we want to try to create a social environment where the ticks aren't the center of attention and that the social reactions for the ticks are eliminated. And we go a long way towards trying to eliminate the, the negative impact socially of the ticks by doing a lot of education uh, about the ticks with both the family and, if necessary, the schools. All right. Functional assessment. After we develop our treatment plan, um, after we develop our interventions, then we have a, a session where we discuss with the parents how the different interventions that we've come up with as a package for their child should be implemented. Uh, if there's any training that we need to do to help the child, that's why we do it, uh, into, like teaching them relaxation skills, so on and so forth. Okay. Questions at this point before we go session by session? Oh, yeah, no, we would always just work on eliminating boring situations. We would also say, look, you've got a situation that's going to be pretty boring coming up. There's not much you're going to be able to do about it. Here's where you have to really remember to use your exercises. Let's see, how can we help remind you during this time? It would be that kind of thing as well. Yeah. Um, do children who have Tourette's syndrome, are they ever eligible to get um, accommodations at school? Like, for example, if they have some sort of tick that, um, you know, maybe requires extra time for them to start writing because they have to stop and suppress yeah. every time. Absolutely, they get, I mean, and it's, how it's difficult a disability. is that? Like, are parents able to get the accommodations pretty easily yeah. or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. And what is it, it's 503? 504. 504, yeah, 504 plan. Um, those are pretty commonly used in kids with Tourette's. Um, you don't want, they don't necessarily always go for the full IEP. I, I always say if you can avoid a full-blown IEP, do that because the school will love you, if you more if you don't go that route, at least, if at least they're compliant with the 504 plans. 
um, which sometimes you get a little hesitation. But generally, I mean, they're they're covered under a disability uh, law. So, yeah. Other questions? Okay. So session by session review of actually it's CBIT, not habit reversal, but. Um, we have eight standard sessions plus boosters as needed. Think about this. I mean, when I have a patient that comes in, I say, look, give me eight sessions. Promise me eight sessions. We may use less. We may use more. The data will tell us, you know, your progress will tell us. But give me eight sessions. I promise you we will know by the end of eight sessions whether this is doing anything. If it's not, I'll be the first one to tell you we don't need to be doing this anymore. If it's working, you'll know and you'll feel okay, and then we can decide whether we continue or not. And also keep in mind that even after eight sessions, we're not done. You're always welcome to come back. You know, you might, two years later, you might come back and want to tune up. That's great. Just call. And that's what we do. And I still have patients every once in a while who, who will call up and say, you know, I came into your clinic like four years ago and my ticks have been okay, but you know, just this last year, it's gotten a, little, gotten a little worse again. Can I come in? Sure, come back in. A couple sessions later, we're done again. And so you have to kind of keep that open mentality about that. Sessions are 60 to 90 minutes in length. The first two sessions are usually 90 because they're longer, uh, longer more content, and then 60 sessions after that. Honestly, by the time you get to session seven and eight, it wouldn't be hard to do a 30 minute session because they've learned the skills and they, they kind of know. Uh, as I said, parents and children both participate in the therapy experience and we frame this as a collaborative effort. In session one, we don't do any habit reversal. At this point, it's getting to you know, know more about the patient. Session one here is assuming you've done your intake interview and all this kind of stuff. This is truly treatment session one. Uh, we review the tick disorder related problems, provide the rationale for habit reversal. You know, we're trying to make you aware of and trying to teach you to control a movement that you haven't tried before. Um, we want to create a tick hierarchy. The tick hierarchy allows us to establish the order in which we'll treat ticks. And we'll do this every week. And then we'll present the rationale for the reward program and establish our self-monitoring and weekly homework. So tick symptom hierarchy tracker. This is how we determine which symptoms to treat in the order in which we treat them. We list all the ticks that the child is currently doing. And we use the YGTSS, such as the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale, as a guide because it has all ticks over the past week. We list all the ticks down and we say, these are the ticks we think you're doing. Are you doing anything else? We'll catch those. And then for each of the ticks that they list currently doing, we have them rate on a zero to 10 point scale how bothersome the ticks are. Zero meaning not at all bothersome, 10 meaning extraordinarily bothersome. And we have them go through that list. Every week, we have them redo the list and re-rank the ticks. And, and it can change week to week. One might become more of a problem, one might become less of a problem, so on. Our general rule is to start with the most bothersome tick. So the tick that causes them most distress, with one exception. If they start with a tick, the, if the most bothersome tick is something that we think is hard to treat, like eye blinking, we typically won't start with that. We wanna, we wanna start with a tick that is the most bothersome but is also the, one of the easier ones to treat eye blinking, eye rolling, the eye darting stuff being one of the harder ones to treat, will generally take a li little less distressing tick th that we can get a little more success with initially so we can do that buy-in with the kid. All right. Every week, again, we re revisit this list. This is what it looks like. Essentially, they write their symptoms there, and then every week, they give another rating. <clears throat> the behavioral reward system, again, we set this up in the first session. It's a very simple system. It's flexible so that it can become more complex if we need it to be, but we start it very simple. We say we're only doing this to get your child motivated to come to session, to do the work in the session, and to do the homework activities that we ask them to do. Every week we'll revisit it, and every week if you've come to session you get a point. If you worked hard in the last session you get a point, and if you did your homework assignments you get a point. There are 24 total points you could get. You get 20, you get a prize. All right? It's very simple. Now, we'll make it more complicated if we need to. Depend, that's where we bring in our compliance issues. If we have a, a compliance problem, we'll expand this program as much as we need to expand it and intensify it as much as we need to intensify it. Um, but we do sell this as a way to increase general compliance, and we do emphasize very clearly that we're not doing this to reinforce tick reduction. We're reinforcing their compliance with treatment. 
We do a lot of self-monitoring in this treatment. Uh, we have sometimes three to four. I usually do two to three days a week where the parent and the child sit down for a fixed period of time, sometimes 30 minutes. I've gone to more like 15 to 20 minutes where we have the parent and the child sit down together at a time where the child's, or, child's ticks are most likely to happen. And the parents and the children sit down together and are doing whatever. They're not staring at each other. They're watching television or whatever and then counting the child's ticks as they see them. And what we're getting to do is two things. One is to help focus the child on paying attention to the ticks. And two is to get some investment with, for mom and dad to be involved in the treatment process. And we, it looks like that, that form. In session two, we review the past homework. We update the tick hierarchy, see if there's any changes there, any new ticks that have started, any changes in severity that occur. Uh, we review the homework and the behavioral reward program. Then we do our psychoeducation about ticks. We teach them about various aspects of the tick disorder. Uh, depending on who your patient is, sometimes they can be very savvy about the Tourette's. Sometimes they have no idea. They don't know the first thing about Tourette's. Uh, we'll do the inconvenience review, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then we'll do habit reversal for the first tick on the hierarchy, the full habit reversal treatment. And we'll also do the functional assessment and function-based intervention for the first tick on the hierarchy. At the end, we do homework, which is the child uses the competing response during planned, which means monitoring periods, and unplanned, which means every other time. Uh, throughout the rest of the, the time, the functional assessment, our function-based interventions will get implemented, and the self-monitoring will continue. For psychoeducation, we give them the rationale for, for therapy. We distinguish between DSM-IV's chronic tick disorder diagnosis and Tourette's diagnosis, letting them know that Tourette's really doesn't mean anything different than chronic tick disorder. We provide a list of ticks uh, that people typically have because a lot of times people think, oh, nobody else on, er on earth does this. And when you see the list of ticks that are out there, it's like, wow, people do everything. And I, I do this, 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 and this, and this. We talk about the phenomenology like the urges and so on. We talk about the natural history of ticks, the waxing and waning and the peak at, in adolescence and the diminishment, so on and so forth. Go through all those kinds of things uh, for the patient. Uh, tick hassles form and list of competing responses. We include these things. The tick hassles form, we list all the inconveniences that the ticks cause on one sheet. We revisit this every week, add to them. If there are any new problems that the ticks are causing, we, we bring those up. We have them rate how much of a problem it's been for them in the last week. And then what we hope to see is as time progresses, the child's inconveniences or hassles related to the ticks start to fall away. The list of competing responses is essentially like a diary that goes with the treatment. The kids keep this list, and every time a new competing response is developed, they write down a description of that competing response so they can remember what it is when they need it later on. That's the hassles form. They list their hassles on the left, and then each week they rate it on a 0 to 10 point scale, how much of a problem it's been this week. List of competing responses, just a simple diagram, or simple graph. Now pretty much from here on out, it's the same treatment. Okay? It, we review the homework, review past, history, uh, past week, uh, do a little more psychoeducation, review habit reversal and function-based treatments for tick one. If, if there are problems, we stick with it and keep working on it, work out the problems. If everything's fine, we move to tick two and do habit reversal and function-based interventions for tick two. Okay? We kind of have to gauge progress and we assign our homework, which is doing the exercises, doing the function-based interventions, and doing the self-monitoring. Session four, it's the same thing. Review previous habit reversal for previous ticks and function-based interventions for previous ticks, and then select another tick and do it for the next tick. Session five is roughly when we introduce relaxation training. We do very brief relaxation training protocols, and we do that so the kids can use that relaxation training in um, times when they're more stressed or anxious. It's just a, an as-needed kind of thing. We keep going, essentially, until session eight, where we summarize everything we've done. We talk about any new ticks that are potentially uh, there, any old ticks that weren't dealt with in treatment that could come back. We review competing responses for those, talk about those, talk about relapse training and reminding them that, hey, this disorder hasn't gone away, it's still here. Keep in mind that it may come back and flare up and how should you respond when it flares and comes, comes back. So we'll talk about those kinds of things. And we'll invite them to um, stay with 
uh, stay with, stay in communication with us, even if they're not coming to session. So, at that point, then we end the week ten, which is our last session. We go into booster sessions, and again, it's the same thing. They come back in, we review their what, what's happening. If something's not going well, we talk about what's not going well, so on. Review the skills for them. You know, after the first few sessions, it gets pretty routine. You know, new ticks might be, you, know, you might have to do something with a new tick, but generally it's, it's review. And you can see if a, if a child comes in with one tick, that's all they want to deal with, then this could take two sessions. If a child comes in with 25 ticks, it might take a lot longer. And, it's, and, and, and you, you have to keep in mind that not every tick needs to be targeted. What we do is we target the ticks that the kids want to focus on, the ones that are causing them most distress. It's not uncommon at all for us to say, you know, we've dealt with five ticks that you most want to deal with. You still have 15 ticks, but you don't have a problem with any of those, so no, no worries. We're, we're good. And, and, and that's fine to do that. Uh, so it's really kind of targeting the treatment to fit what the child wants and needs. Okay. All right. Any questions at this point? Yeah. What's the um, average um, how many ticks do kids typically do that Oh. It's all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I think I've probably seen upper ranges in the 30s. Um, you know, most often it's probably 5 to 10, I would guess. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so CBIT includes a number of components. Has anyone ever done a components analysis? No. We, um, well, not, not of the CBIT treatment itself. Um, I, what I, for my master's thesis, I did kind of a component. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I, it was, I, I got into this completely by accident, actually. But um, my, uh, my master's thesis uh, was a somewhat of a component analysis. And what we found for that was awareness training. We, we had, it was a single subject experimental design. And we found, oh, we, we sequenced in the intervention. And it's probably not the best way to do it, but the master's thesis. So we started out with awareness training, and we wanted to see who responded to awareness training. And if they didn't respond, then we added in uh, self-monitoring. And then we added in uh, competing response training, and then we added in social support. And what we found was that one child actually responded to awareness training alone, which was simply just making them aware of the tick. But what we found out with that child was actually, once he was made aware of the tick, he started tensing his neck every time he felt like he had to do it. And so he actually did competing response training. Uh, and ultimately what we found from that study was that the bare minimum components are awareness training and competing response training. The social support was questionable. But if you don't have awareness training and competing response training, it probably won't work. So that's a habit reversal, though. Yeah. So, yeah. How important is it for the kid to be practicing in between sessions? Uh, Essential. Is there, data? is there any data on that? So that's the biggest problem we have in behavioral parent, tra parent training. Parents of ADHD kids is trying to get them to do their homework. So how does this work? If, the, if they don't do the exercises between sessions, it won't work. I just, I mean, and you guys, how do you track that? How do you track whether they do or don't? Um, we, well, in turn, <laughs> this is just parent report. I mean, I, this is my clinical impression. We don't have true good data on this. Every kid that fails has that, that, that report of the parents saying he doesn't do his exercises, he never does it, you know, and that's just that almost goes without saying. So, um, and I think you'll see, you see pretty quickly once you see the treatment actually work, you understand completely where they're coming from. If you do the ex, if you have a real kid here who's doing this, if they're doing the exercise the way they're they're told to do it, they're instructed to do it, the ticks don't happen. You know, the, the, or they, they have to diminish by definition. It's kind of like the definition of punishment. You know, you can't you can't define something as a punisher unless it goes down. And so uh, it, 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 that's where that, that that in between session compliance is a big deal for us. So would the, would this work for everybody if you put them in a situation where you could enforce practice for some extended period of time, like you put them in a, a summer camp? all day for two weeks or three weeks, and you can enforce practice all during that time period. But if you got everybody practicing, you knew they had done it, and would you expect it to work with everybody? I, I will never say everybody, but I know we can do a lot better than 52%. <laughs> I mean, I, I have no doubt. If we had control, 
over the environment, complete control over the environment. Um, you, I mean, for example, I did my internship at Boys Town, um, which is in, in Omaha. It's a it's a um, it's a huge uh, point contingency program, you know. And we had a, a person in there who had Tourette's when I was there. And uh, you know, th this really pretty serious case of Tourette's. But I got to tell you, once we started implementing this with the contingency program, when, once the point program was put in play with the habit reversal, you know, it, some of the most problematic ticks just dropped right, right like stones. It's amazing. Because um, we had control over the compliance issue. You know, he had people who were watching him pretty much 24 hours a day and consequating effectively um, for that, for that compliance. So it, it, was, it was actually pretty interesting that way. So yeah, I think it could. Yeah. What's the least number of hours they should be practicing? Because they are usually in school for seven hours or so. Well, it's not a, it's not a number of hours thing. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with how often, it has to do with, think of it as a, a percent of opportunities. So every time they have an urge to tick or do the tick, the question is how, how, what percentage of the time do they actually do what they should do? Not how much like real hour time, but what percent of opportunities to do the exercises do they actually do them? You know, what we'd like to see is at 80%. We've actually have some studies that say even if they get to be 50% compliant, so they catch 50% of the ticks, catch 50% of the urges and they do their exercises, that they'll still respond pretty well. You know, which I think is actually pretty promising when you get a 50% only 50% compliance and you can still get some, some good effects. I think that's pretty good. So it's, again, it's not I have to practice six hours a week or anything like that. It's I want to get at least 50% of the urges or the ticks met with a competing response. Yeah, the problem is that they're in school, so you don't have much control of how much they come Well, unless eventually you bring the teachers in. And a lot of times I ultimately will. Once I get good at, once the kid gets good at this at home, that's when we start bringing the teachers in to try to help out. And we still encourage the, t this, the child to say, hey, you know, if they're really buying into it, they'll start doing it at school, too. So that, that's important, too. Yeah. Um, do you know if anyone's ever tried, like, an intensive, shorter version of this treatment where you might really work on it for a solid week every single day with the child? The data on intensive treatment isn't good. I mean, not bad. It's just not there. You know, we, we haven't really published a lot on intensive versions of this. I think, you know, it, it can be useful as long as the, the, the folks stick with it once they go back home. I think that's, that's the big thing. So, yeah. Do you think that the learned behavior is an adult in house and has ticks, and also that the child would pick that up? Uh, yes and no. And, and here's what I mean by that. If a child doesn't have any kind of Tourette predisposition, if they don't have the neurology, that's, it's not going to happen. You know, but if you have a child who's kind of predisposed to have Tourette's and they started to emerge with ticks and they have a parent who's doing a tick, the child can pick that tick up. You know, so like, you know, the yawning thing, they can imitate that and that can start to become a tick. You know, you go to a Tourette's conference. Tourette's conferences are actually a lot of fun to go to. You go in and, you know, there are a hundred people with Tourette's sitting in the room and one starts barking and you hear an echo of barks that go throughout the, 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 the thing and they all do the same tick, even though most of them don't have that as a real tick. They start to mimic what they're seeing. So you can see it that way. But in terms of causing it, no. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so kind of to piggyback on what you just said, how, how do you think it would be to put, you know, a lot of kids, let's say in a summer camp program or something like that, in which they could potentially like pick up, um, you know, different ticks and behaviors from each other. I guess it would be similar to what we do here, that they could potentially pick up behaviors. But do you think... Um, like, does the mimicking drop off at some point, or does it, do you know what I mean? Like, if you're putting a whole bunch of kids together for the whole entire day to have a lot of different types of ticks. Yeah. I think you'll see some, some contagion going on there. I, I, I wouldn't get too worked up about it as being anything permanent. And if it did, I mean, that's, you're in a great position to be able to deal with something at that point, given the, the kind of the group format. It's going to be interesting. I'm actually, I'm going to Norway in a couple of weeks. Uh, at the request of the, the, they have a federally funded Norwegian Tourette's Resource Center. And one of the reasons I'm going there is um, they're running a summer camp, a summer week for kids with Tourette's. 
and they're getting kids from a couple different countries, the U.S. and a couple from Norway, you know, like 20 from Norway, and they're going all around Norway to different things. It'll be interesting to be able to be in that kind of environment for a week and to see how that kind of thing plays out, because I, I honestly don't know what to expect. My gut reaction is there might be a little bit of that contagion kind of thing going on at first, and then it'll fade away, but I'll, I'll know more in about a month. So. <laughs> Yeah. Do you guys um, do you do analog analysis for like when you guys were doing the when you were talking about the functional analysis of behavior that you interview the parents like um, you know to identify antecedent and consequent events? Do you do also like analog analysis like where you set up the not ways appropriate? Yeah. Not as part of our clinical evaluations. Uh, it just takes too long for us. You know, we we could spend days just doing that, and I don't know that we'd gain much out of it, frankly. Clinical. So parent report is pretty pretty accurate. Um. I wouldn't say that, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we, we, we generally just don't have a ton of time. Between the kid and the parent, we can usually get a fairly decent description, but the parents and the kids usually conflict each other a lot, and then we just kind of have to play out and see what happens. Um, but, but there are, I mean, we do stuff uh, in terms of our research lab, we do those kind of analog FA kinds of things, versions of it, and there are other groups around the country who do those analog FA um, kind of kind of procedures and, and what we what we find pretty much maps on to what you'd expect. I mean the environmental effects clearly bump ticks around and so on. And do you guys use like the fast and the mass and like all the other behavioral tools that are typically used to like um, or is it just kind of like an ABC parent it's, report? It, it's an ABC parent report kind of thing. Yeah we don't you don't go for anything more than that. Yeah. And we have some some of our forms are based on structured functional analysis models and so on and so forth. Like there's that grid we put out there, we pretty much swipe the format right out of, uh, of uh, oh, what's his name, Rob Horner's functional assessment book, because um, I love that grid and the structure he uses for interviews. So we, we kind of use that, but um, thanks, Rob, if you're watching. Uh, other questions? Can you be successful in treatment just by having the child alone? versus having a child with a parent? I think the older the child and the more motivated the child is, yes. So the child is sad and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even do that. And I just, I can't, yeah, I mean, because the parent's got to implement so much of this intervention. I just, I, I you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend doing that otherwise. Other questions?